Good morning again, everybody. A warm welcome to Covenant United Methodist Church as we gather to worship remotely. I do hope that this Sunday finds you well. Um, and just know that you are welcome uh, in this digital space. And we pray that God's Spirit will minister to you at this time. I do hope things are going well for you. Uh, in the Hudson household, things are about to change. Uh, we are about to lose two, but gain four. Uh, lose two, our uh, youngest son is heading back to New York uh, with his girlfriend uh, because his physical therapy practice that he works for is opening back up again. Um, and we're about to gain four in the sense that uh, we will be purchasing four chickens that will be living in our backyard as uh, we adopt a lifestyle change. Uh, of seeking to live more in harmony with this, be with this beautiful creation that we live in. But a warm welcome to you, and I do hope that in spite of these difficult days, uh, that you're finding God present, uh, and that the spirit of God's healing um, is giving you peace uh, and keeping you hope-filled. The gospel is, has changed from what we initially uh, put out, and it has changed to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And it has changed because we have a, a guest preacher this morning. And the guest preacher, courtesy of, a, of our adult ed committee, uh, is Brian McLaren. Um, and there'll be a link for you to go to the sermon that he presents. Listen with me to the Gospel of Luke. The parable of the shrewd manager. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind then are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money thus far. Good morning, everyone. Well, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Normally, I do the same scripture that Pastor Roger does. But today, I thought, you know what? I really want to do an Old Testament story because the Old Testament stories, those are the cool stories. Those are the fun stories. You'll get this one pretty easily, but I like it anyway. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Anybody have a guess? I bet you probably guessed it by now. Kind of an obvious one. Who 
got it. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I bet you got it. Let's give him an eyeball. And then we'll get on with our story. It's the story about a whale. What was the guy's name? Do you remember? His name was Jonah. I'll put the whale down for a moment. Well, let's put it here. Well, Jonah was at his house one day and God spoke to him and he said, Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh. Those people are bad people over there and I need you to go and tell them to turn around, to repent as we call it and turn to God. And Jonah's like, you have got to be kidding me. He said, God, have you seen those people in Nineveh? They are mean people. They will look at me, roll their eyes, and beat me up. I am not going to Nineveh. Anywhere you want me to go, Lord, not there. So God said, no, no, that's where I want you to go. And Jonah said, <laughs> funny. So he went down, acting like he was going to go to Nineveh, went down to where all the boats were, he went up to the ticket counter, and instead of asking for a ticket for Nineveh, he said to the ticket man, please give me a ticket as far away from Nineveh as there is. So the ticket man said, okay, you can go over here. So Jonah got on the boat, and he started sailing, sailing, sailing. None of us ever here. He starts sailing this way. Well, when they got about halfway, and the boat starts tossing and turning and a big storm comes up and the captain comes down and looks at all the people on the ship. He said, which one of you, which one of you is God mad at? And Jonah thought, oh man, he raised his hand. All right, God, I, I mean, Mr. Captain Guy, I suppose it's me. And the captain said, well, off with you. And he threw him overboard. So Jonah now is in the ocean. See it falling, 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 and you know the story. The whale comes along, sees something falling, thinks it's just some nice big chunk of plankton, boom, and eats Jonah, swallows him up, and starts swimming. Uh, now Jonah is in the belly of the whale, and Jonah's like, okay, all right, God, you win, you win. If you want me to go to Nineveh, just get me out of the belly of this whale. I will do whatever you want me to do. And he continued swimming and he continued swimming. And before long, burr, and wah! There's Jonah, falls out of the belly of the whale, and you'll never guess where he was. He was on dry land, and it just happened to be Nineveh. So Jonah got up and went and spoke to the people of Nineveh, and they listened to him, and they believed him, and they turned around and turned their hearts and went back to God. And that's our story for this morning of Jonah and the whale. Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high stormy gale my anchor holds within 
stand before the throne. Brian McLaren was introduced to us by our, our adult ed committee um, as uh, offering a really exciting and uh, stimulating thought on the Gospel of Luke 16. And so I decided that rather than have two messages this Sunday, we'd have just simply treat Brian as our guest preacher. But there was a little bit of an overlap in what was happening in my own devotional life um, over this past week. And you will note as I read the gospel, the final verse of Luke 16, verse 13 says this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We'd like to invite you at the conclusion of this worship service, perhaps to go and visit my blog um, and learn a little bit more about the four chickens that will be joining um, our family uh, fairly soon in our uh, potager garden. Uh, there's a reflection there on living in a way that is pleasing to God, worshipping God before money. And perhaps it's a little bit of a different take uh, in terms of how we can um, live a, a faithful witness in God's kingdom. But for now, I invite you to go to the link that will take you to the message that Brian McLaren will bring us. I love this passage in Luke 16. Uh, a lot of people know that in Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables, a parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And those three parables are given in answer to the Pharisees, the religious leaders who were criticizing Jesus because he was hanging out with sinners, uh, the wrong people. And... Uh, uh, and what a lot of people don't realize is that Luke 16 is a continuation of that same uh, conversation. Uh, so Jesus not only gives those three parables, he gives two more parables, a total of five parables. The first three, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. The next two, there is a rich man, there is a rich man. And uh, what we find out is that the real problem of the Pharisees, the reason that they didn't properly value people, they just said, oh, they're sinners, they're worthless, they're not worth your time. The reason they didn't properly value people is that they improperly valued money. They loved money way too much. So if we only tell those first three parables without the last two, I think we let ourselves off the hook about our problems with money. Now, I know it's hard to imagine Americans having a problem with money, but boy, this is a time for us to face one of Jesus' most important and liberating messages. And it comes in a parable that people think is super hard to understand, super hard to interpret. I just got to tell you, if you know a little bit of basic information about Palestinian economics, 
of the uh, first century, I think this parable is absolutely obvious, so easy to understand that it just scares us uh, with its bold and blunt message. Are you ready? It starts with the Romans. You've got to remember, the backdrop to the entire Gospels is the occupation of, uh, of Israel-Palestine by the Romans. And the Romans would come in as occupiers, and they would uh, do two things. They would exploit natural resources, and they would exploit the labor of the people. And uh, they would uh, do this in large part through taxation. They tax people. Now look, I know it's really hard to imagine a world where the rich people get off without paying a lot of taxes, but the poor people have to pay a lot of taxes. I know it's hard to imagine that. Just imagine that it happened back in the Roman era. And it also helps if you know that the rich people lived in the south, in the state of Judea, where the capital city and religious capital, Jerusalem, was. And the poor people, the small farmers, lived in the north, in Galilee. And so what's happening is the Romans are occupying and they need a lot of wine, wheat, and olive oil from the farmlands of Galilee. And so uh, they, you would think, oh, this is a chance for the small farmers to get rich. Didn't work that way. Uh, what happened is the Romans would tax the small farmers. They couldn't afford to pay their taxes. And then their rich fellow uh, people of their same culture and religion down in Judea would come up and say, oh, have we got a deal for you, small farmers? We will pay your taxes in exchange for the deed to your property. But don't worry, you can live on as tenant farmers on our property. And for the low cost of every year, giving us a percentage of your wheat, your wine, and your olive oil. And then those rich guys from the south, they would sell the wheat for Roman bread. They would sell the uh, wine for Roman banquets. And they would sell the olive oil for, I guess, Caesar salad or whatever. Big market in Rome. And so the guys in the south, I, I know it's hard to imagine the rich getting richer while the poor get even more pressure on them, but it happened. And so um, if you understand that background, one little added detail. So when those rich guys in the south wanted to get their tribute, their portion of the uh, crops of the farmers up north, they didn't want to have to go. It probably wasn't even safe for them to go because they were so hated by the people who were exploiting them. They would send mid-level managers to go. Um, they were called stewards or managers. And they were sent to go and say, OK, pay up. We need your 30 barrels of olive oil. We need your you know, 20 measures of wheat or whatever it would be. And so that's the backdrop for this really interesting story. There was a rich man. Now you got the background, what that means who had a manager. Now you know what a manager does. And the rich man's mad at the manager because he's squandering his holdings. What does that mean? He's not getting a big enough return on investment. He's not squeezing those farmers hard enough. And so he says, I'm going to fire you. You are not getting me enough out of those farmers up there. And you can just imagine the dialogue because what do rich people say? Those farmers are lazy. They have no idea what it's like to work out in the hot sun. But they just project all that on, on these poor people. And so they say, he, he says, you aren't getting the return on investment for me. I'm going to fire you. I want you to get the books ready to turn in the books uh, so you're going to be fired. Well, at that moment, this manager he represents probably a lot of us, kind of the middle class folks who are just trying to get by, right? He's, he's caught in the middle he, he, between the, the rich and the poor. And he says, gosh, you know, I work for this guy all these years, and now he's ready to throw me out, and I have no security. I, I don't want to have to be a ditch digger. I, I, I don't want to have to beg. And when he realizes how expendable he was to that rich guy above him in the economic pyramid, he says, I'm going to switch sides. I'm going to start, I'm going to arrange things so that I'll now have friends 
among the poor. So he says, hey, how much, uh, he goes up north. He says, hey, uh, how much olive oil did you owe my master? A hundred barrels? Hey, we'll make it 80, you know. How, how much wine did you owe? A couple metric tons? Uh, we'll, we'll make it 1.2. And so he, he gets some return for the guy, but he does it in a way that gives a break to the poor. Simple way to say what this story is about. It's about, not about somebody who is evil and terrible. It's about somebody who saw through the injustice of the economic system and decided to switch sides and work for the poor. Uh, and so Jesus, if, if you doubt that's his message, he says, no, listen. He says, uh, you better learn that money isn't the ultimate measure of all things. You would be way better to use your money on the, uh, in service of relationships rather than to use relationships in service of money. Jesus goes on to say, you can't serve two masters. And he uses strong language. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't be brave enough to say what he says next unless he had said it first. He says, you will either hate God and love money or love God and hate money. Now look, we all have to use money. But if you start taking seriously what Jesus said, you almost feel like every time you take out your wallet, you, you should wash your hands because you can be made dirty by the ways that money causes us to improperly value other things. You know, we have a culture that looks at the oceans and the mountains and the rivers and the soil and doesn't think about their inherent value at all. We only think about how we can convert them or use them to make short-term profit for those people at the top of the economic pyramid. Money has brainwashed us. Money has blinded us. And if you're resisting what I'm saying right now, take that as a sign of how deep the holes uh, in, in the hooks in all of us that money actually has. I think the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed has an economic system. And the economic system of God invites all of us to lose faith in the system that says, let the rich do whatever they want and let whatever little crumbs can trickle down to the rest of us. No, it says everybody matters. Put God at the top, love God, and everything else will have a new value. You'll see everything else in a new value system. And you'll stop, you'll, you'll come to realize that you're actually totally expendable by all the people who are using you to make money off of the backs of people below you. You're going to see things differently. You're going to be set free. You're going to be liberated if you will love God first and put money in its proper place. Amen. Let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, we turn to you on this Sunday as the God who created everything that is and created each and every one of us as well. We find ourselves at this time in the belly of the whale, in the darkness of this pandemic and everything that it is doing to threaten all that we are used to. And we confess that within all of us, there's this deep longing for life just simply to return as normal. And yet perhaps we pause, affirming that you didn't cause this pandemic or the associated tragedies that accompany it. But we pause just to reflect upon what we might learn in the darkness and in the struggle of this time. We turn to you as the God who promises to be with us, and we pray, Lord, that you will be with every person who is struggling, 
those who are suffering with the virus, but also those who are suffering other diseases and illnesses as well. Be with them. We pray that you would lay your healing hand upon them, but above all, we ask that your presence will be very real, not only working healing within them, but comforting them and giving them the strength of your peace. We pray for the world, for people throughout this beautiful globe that you have fashioned and given to us as a gift. And Lord, we pray that this opportunity in which we find ourselves united in struggle as we face one particular disease, we ask that you might work amongst us and unite us as we find ourselves once again drawing, looking to you for guidance and drawing upon you for strength. And from your presence, Lord, may we begin to discover that which is important the bonds of love, love for you, love for you, for all people, and love for your creation. And based upon that love, may we once again recommit ourselves to building your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so thank you for this time. We worship from distant places, and yet, Lord, we feel the love for one another. Be with us. Guide us, keep us, and keep us ever hopeful. Amen. So folks, as we end our worship service on the sixth Sunday of Easter, I remind you of the four things that keep us working together. Stay safe, two things, pray and give. Stay safe. Continue to practice your social distancing as a way of caring for those who are vulnerable. Two things, make two phone calls today. One to somebody you know uh, who is a member of the, of the church, but also somebody who you wouldn't normally speak to and simply let them know that you're thinking of them. Thirdly, pray. Continue with your own devotionals and allow God's Spirit to walk with you through this darkness, through these days. And then once again, if you have any particular prayer concerns, we meet in the side chapel every Wednesday. Let us know what your prayer concerns are, and we will pray, uh, list them, and bring them to God each Wednesday. And finally, give. Give generously in support of the ministries of your church, for we remain active. And give very specifically, if you're able, on Monday or Thursday in the Covenant Drop Zone. We are actively trying to support the three ministries. The Ministry of Shalom, the Ministry of Family Promise, uh, and New Hope, uh, who care for those who are most vulnerable and who need food and other assistance. And finally, also remember that we're also beginning to plan a support uh, initiative for our sister church down in El Salvador. And so as we end our time together, know this. We are not just free to go from this hour. We are not just, just simply dismissed. Rather, we are sent in Christ's name to live, love, and serve in all that we do. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.